Oh, so far. So welcome to the second edition of the Trigger Project uh, Carousel. So today uh, we will have three speakers. These are the um, Sandra Perez, uh, Nigo Martin, Martin, and Neil Moffat. And these are the, uh, the new projects that were approved this year for 2024. So uh, I imagine they will explain uh, which is the idea uh, of their project. The trigger project, just a reminder, these are uh, internal project, the money come from uh, CNM. And uh, the goal of this project was to promote young researcher. So uh, this is the second time we do it. So next next week, I think, we will have the, um, the presentation of the project approved last year. No, um, April. Ah, ah, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, April, it was a March, okay, sorry, so it will be in one month uh, of the project that were approved last year and uh, they should be almost uh, terminated, so they, they will show the results there. So we start with uh, Inigo and uh, his talk is on laser induced graphene for thermoelectric generators. Inigo, start. There is no bio. There is no bio on your. Uh, so good morning. So I'm presenting the project that was selected. It uh, was granted within the energy and mobility axis. So it has to do with micro energy harvesting in the frame of Internet of Things applications, and it uh, means that uh, integrating this new material, laser induced graphene, into the the devices. So we know uh, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. It's about having a ubiquitous uh, electronics, like electronic node sensors everywhere uh, for many applications uh, in different sectors. So, so this, uh, these uh, sensors are increasingly augmenting and we have like millions, uh, billions, and there's trillions of predictions, right? So uh, these uh, devices, these sensors nodes, they are different, uh, they can be uh, uh, used differently. So we can have, for example, uh, smart watches that we carry with us. So there could be maybe some sensor of, uh, on a machine, or it could be maybe some sensor node on a packet that is traveling worldwide, and we are using it to track where the packet is. So they, they have different uh, uses, let's say. So one thing that we uh, that is challenging is how to power these devices. And depending on how we use them, then the way to tackle it should be different. So the most standard way to tackle the power of the, these devices is not is using batteries. So these are good, uh, but they have some uh, challenges like when they have finite charge. Uh, so at some point they will need some replacement. So if we have the device with us, it's easy to replace or to charge. And let's say uh, it's not very well, very accessible. So it will be hard to access. Or maybe we don't even know where the device is, so we don't even we cannot even uh, replace the battery. So maybe we can leave the sensor to die and uh, introduce another one in the network. But then we might incur in some, uh, I mean, given the device in the environment, it will incur into toxic materials being there and to hazards on the environment, right? So we need to go towards uh, more sustainable solutions. And there is where energy harvesting uh, comes into to work. So in our group, we are working with thermal energy harvesting. And because we are at the Institute of Microelectronics, uh, we are very experienced on silicon uh, technologies and silicon related materials micro nanotechnologies, and especially on banks. So we try to combine both to come up with devices that will, uh, will incorporate uh, solutions to providing energy to these kind of devices that will be uh, more sustainable. So we can benefit from the miniaturization of the silicon technologies to have a uh, devices that are compatible with integrated circuits. And uh, we can benefit from large scale manufacturing just to have a some solutions that can provide solutions to these uh, two years of sensors that we have in the network. Okay, so 
the project uh, tackles this device here. So it's a uh, um, electric uh, generator that is based on a, on a thin field material. So the thermal, uh, thermoelectric material. So we apply a temperature difference across the material and we get some voltage outcome. So in our case, the structure of the device is um, so we create a, a difference in temperature across a membrane that we fabricate by um, by, my, um, by machining silicon. And, um, and so we have, uh, by placing the, the device on a hot surface, so we have uh, like a hot edge of the membrane and the cold side of the membrane states the inside of the membrane. So uh, this way we create the temperature uh, difference across the thermoelectric and get, we get the output voltage. Um, so this is an easy operation of the device, but there's uh, some limitations here is that the heat dissipation on the membrane is very, uh, is, uh, very low. So the temperature we get at the membrane is far, uh, it's uh, higher than the, much higher than the temperature we have in the environment. And here to maximize the output of the device, uh, any degree counts. So somehow we need to pull down the membrane here so that we can maximize the temperature difference across the thermometer. So for this, the group has also implemented a, a solution that is based on developing a new a chip, an adapter that we place on top of the of the thermoelectric generator, so that uh, we can contact uh, we contact only the the heating at the center of the membranes, and we extract the heat from over there, and without becoming contaminated with a uh, cross uh, top from the thermal well, from the heat on the on the remaining of the rest of the chip. So we are implementing this on this uh, thermoelectric generator. And um, so here it's, it's very critical, the interface between the adapter here, the, this post and the membrane. So in this frame, the project means uh, the exploring whether we could use this uh, carbon-based material, uh, laser induced graphene, to improve this uh, thermal interface between this adapter and the membrane. Okay, and how this uh, material will impact the performance of the thermoelectric uh, generator. So there's like three phases. So first, uh, I need to grow the phase in this graphene on, on thin thin polymers that we can have on these wafers that we are fabricating. Then we need to find out the way to integrate this uh, material uh, nicely on the wafer so that later we can have this adapter on top. And then the last phase is to check how the, to benchmark how this uh, device with the laser induced graphene is performing. Okay. Um, so laser induced graphene is a form of carbon and carbon has been long been explored as a thermal interface material. So there's uh, other graphite materials like graphene or carbon nanotubes that have records in uh, heat uh, conductivity, but they are hard to implement because of uh, challenges in the integration. So here, let's see induced graphene uh, has a very simple fabrication uh, method that is based on uh, lacing some specific polymers with specific lasers, and then this uh, react with some photothermal reaction here that converts the polymer into this uh, porous 3D graphene. Okay, by tuning the lacing conditions, you can tune, this is uh, the structure of the material you get here, and you can tune, for example, uh, the sheet resistance of the layers. So this is some Raman spectroscopy of the different uh, lacing induced graphene that you get after lacing with different conditions, and this the difference between these peaks tells you that the structure is changing depending on the power of the leak. Okay, so making leak, it's, it's very, very, very simple. Once you optimize 
once you optimize the, the polymer and the conditions for the laser. So this is a video on this reference here. And it's a run, the laser is going through the polymer and it's uh, just writing the, the material. And so recent advances, they say also that uh, the polymers we use in the clean room for, let's say, for photolithography, some of them are compatible with also making this leak. And I mean, I found this very motivating, okay? Okay, so also I'd like to say that the project is not starting from scratch. So Elia was a uh, teaming with Juan Pablo Esquivel, and we proved that we can, we could uh, grow this uh, leak in-house. So we did in two phases. First, we checked with the standard for minimal substrate, and later we checked, we validated that we could grow also the leak on, on cardboard-like paper, uh, like substrates. And these are like Raman and cheat resistance measurements after different conditions. So now, uh, as I said, there's three phases. So the first one, I need, to, I am um, in the clean room preparing these polymers on silicon-like substrate. And with those ones, um, we are exploring different lacing conditions to grow the materials. So there's some uh, optical SEM uh, characterization of the samples. There's some Raman analysis and some electrical analysis of the of the material. With all these um, lacing conditions, uh, we work them out to find the strategy to nicely pattern the lead on, on the different wafers. Uh, and once the integration strategy will be clear, uh, then we will come to the thermoelectric platforms and devices. And, and I will really check like how the leak performs as a thermal interface material. And then we will integrate this material into the proper device, thermal, thermal electric generator devices and perform how the this impacts the performance of the generators. Okay, so I hope the project will impact on creating new knowledge on the growth and integration with silicon substrates and MEMS, MEMS devices and new knowledge on leak as a thermal interface material. So the meaning of the project is to improve the performance of the thermal electric generators and to move the device and the technology to higher tier levels. Uh, and I hope that besides the generator, it will open up uh, new routes to devices like printed or flexible uh, centers that are uh, that we are all making here or other applications. So this is all from my side. Is any question? So. Question? Done? So I understand that uh, when, the, when the lacing the, for example, the capital, uh, and, and the whole thickness becomes uh, rah right? Or only the, only, only the top surface? It, it depends on the thickness of the polymer. Okay. So it's something that needs to be optimized also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that's uh, interesting also. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, mean, uh, so, um, I think it, it would yeah, be valuable to, some, some applications is valuable to convert everything. Yeah. In other cases, it might be valuable not to convert everything. Yeah. And how, how fast? Is the uh, laser exposition on the planet? I mean, the video was like, uh, it could be like uh, real time. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just a question about the process. Uh, does it require any cleaning step? You just get the. So the polymers, they are coated on the surface and they are processed straight. It's laser system. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so now it's a CO2 laser. So it's a laser on the prototyping equipment. But there's other options also. The, um, there's other lasers and options, but um, yeah, there's some other UV wavelength and 
I don't remember exactly the weight number. I mean, there's different options, but the most extended one is the CO2 laser. This is like 10.6 microns, I think. Is it? Where is the This one is in the prototyping lab, rapid prototyping lab. But there's, there's other options also. There's, so we may have other lasers in other researchers' labs here that we can maybe use. So I understood what you get in the in the laser process is like a network of of. Uh, Two-dimensional uh, layers of graphene. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a graphitic material. It has sp two. So graphene or graphite. It's sp two carbon, sp two hybridized carbon. So you get like a, um, a lot of sp two carbon. So it has a graphitic structure. But then it grows in a porous. It, it depends on the conditions. It can be more a porous uh, layer of him, or it can be maybe more uh, columns of fibers. Also. It depends on the condition, maybe on the polymers. And in this porous structure, can you keep a very good thermal conductivity, uh, even though it is so, <clears throat> the it is high, or? Uh, so it will depend a little bit on the structure of the leak. So uh, it's something to work out which structure will work better. Um, but the, so I, I, I mean, it's not going to be the thermal conductivity of graphene. I will be, I expect that it will be uh, quite high, I mean, a good one. So graphitic uh, composites, they are uh, very well considered for these thermal, as thermal interface materials. So. Ah, okay. The same question, okay, okay, fine. Say you, you are also increasing the surface area and actually you are kind of distorting, let's say, the strata which is going to be mm -hmm. That was my question. I don't know why. Are you going to validate this test? I mean, are you are going to measure this uh, thermal conductivity and it's better than the standard? How? Yes, how? So, which method? So we have the platforms and the platforms where we uh, fabricate the generators. They have some heater or inside, so we can use that as a thermometer. So we can compare, uh, I mean, we can directly measure the temperature on the, on the membrane with or without leak or with the, which other conditions. So based on that, we can extract the more question then we can stop thank you Neil. thank you next speaker is uh, neil moffat so neil is in bio so i can from university of uh, oh, glasgow from scotland <laughs> so he has been working in the energy physics uh, experiments in this phd uh at CERN. uh and now is what is with us since uh, three years, four years, two four years, four years. Too many. Uh, he will present his project on photonic integrated circuit for quantum and biosensing. You never mentioned the main point I came here, but to get away uh, from the, the rain and wind of Scotland. <laughs> ah, okay. Find some you. sunshine and light in life. Very Very point. Point. Good. <laughs> Perfect play. No rain. Yeah, no rain at all. Wow. At all. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, thanks for the great introduction, Julio. So yeah, uh, as you said, I'll, I'll be talking about my project, my Twitter project, which is on the photonic integrated circuits for quantum and biosensing applications. It's known as PICA. So I'll just give a quick uh, Outline the talk, uh, motivation, which is important for any project, the aim of the project, introduce my little team, uh, the concept, and just some basic introduction to uh, PIX and to the photo detectors we'll be developing and the, the plan at the end. So, as you can tell from the name of the talk, uh, motivation is based on quantum and biosensing using uh, photonic integrated circuits. So, so why quantum? So, uh, 
at the moment the world is experiencing a high demand in uh, digital communication. How can we increase uh, digital, digital communication? And uh, what are the problems we have in communicating at the moment? Uh, where are the, there's a lot of hackers and maybe want to protect better the information that we send. Uh, so we can do that using some quantum techniques. Uh, there's a lot of money being used or funded by the European uh, Council in trying to improve this. And uh, also looking into quantum computing. Uh, but what they require is the upgrades of the computer hardware for uh, quantum. On the other hand, we have the, the biosensing. So not just looking at uh, photons, but we have uh, electrophotonic systems, which is the detection of both electrons and photons. And uh, these can be useful for the transfer of data between silicon chips, uh, some detection of pollutants, and biological specimens, which is what we're probably looking to most. Uh, for these types of sensings, it would be ideal to have the uh, light emitter on chip with the waveguide and the photonic circuit, as well as the integrated photodiode. But for this project, it's quite small. So, I mean, it's unrealistic to include all components. We're just going to focus on the waveguide and the photodiode. But the, what both have in common is that we need to uh, upgrade uh, and build a better uh, photodiode. So I'm mostly focused on that. So the concept, uh, we want to integrate a silicon photo detector with a silicon nitride uh, platform. Uh, it must be CMOS compatible, and we wanted to combine two technologies, the silicon nitride photo integrated circuit, which is developed here at the uh, CNM with the photonics group, which is this handsome man, uh, Joaquin Vanega. And, uh, and we, I'll be looking at the silicon APDs. Uh, we have a lot of experience in the group uh, building detectors based on the low gain avalanche technology, which I'm going to explain a little bit. Um, actually, Julio uh, came up with the idea, and uh, we want to integrate both. I'll also be getting help from uh, Chacho, or Alfredo, uh, from Mexico uh, for the biosensing side of the photon circuit. So the concept, we have two designs, one's a bit more basic than the other, where we have an optic fiber coupled to a waveguide, and uh, it goes along with that, and we're detecting the light. So that's the basic idea. If we get to the end of the project and we can do this, be quite happy. The second design is a bit more complicated, where we would couple the light, do something with the light, and then detect the light at the end. Um, so uh, what is a pick for, for start? Well, a photonic integrated circuit. Uh, a photonic integrated circuit works similar to uh, an electrical circuit, but instead of working with electrons, you are playing with photons. Uh, the advantages of the PIC uh, well, come from the fact that photons travel a lot faster than electrons, and if we compare it to silicon, a thousand times faster, more or less. Uh, they're good for signal processing and data transfer because they're faster and can be safer, and you can make them very small. Uh, small, low volume, less material, uh, cheaper, and well, let's say more reliable. I'm not sure about that. Um, and then we look at going to more than more, and the, the idea to have all the components on the same chip. Some disadvantages could be that uh, it's complicated to manufacture, and uh, requires specialist equipment, and it could be difficult to integrate different technologies. But we'll we'll go through that in project. Uh, so the main objectives we should try to focus on are the, the improvement of the, the avalanche photodiode, the detection medium, at specific wavelengths that we want to to look at, and uh, that will all be designed, fabricated, and tested here um, uh, for a range of different wavelengths. And the parameters we want to look at are the, the dark current, the responsivity, and the bandwidth. And then if that all goes to plan, we will, uh, the second objective is to combine with the silicon nitride uh, platform. So well, I mentioned quite a few times these uh, APDs or avalanche photodiodes. Uh, what is it? So I'll not go through too many details, but just give you the idea. So we have a detector which can detect things. Um, if you apply a bias voltage or a reverse bias to a detector, what happens is that the, the medium, which is, is made of, in this case, silicon, is deplete of any free charges. If you inject um, a particle or a photon or something which can interact with the medium, what happens is that you create an electron hole pair. And because there's a field generated by the reverse bias, your electrons move up 
and your holes move down. Once you get to this, the uh, uh, cool thing about the APDs is once you get to this uh, gain region here, it's the, the electrons are accelerated. When they're accelerated, they cause what's called impact ionization, which basically the electron causes more electron hole pairs to be generated. What that means is that your signal, instead of being well, some size, it's sometimes size is bigger. So depending on the gain of your detector. So in the APDs, you would imagine that your signal is 100 to 1,000 times larger than you'd expect before. And that gives you a good signal to nudge. Um, and then your holes move to the back. Um, we also have a different type of APD, which is made on a, a different type of substrate. I never mentioned before, but um, in the last case, we're collecting electrons. In this case, we collect holes. Bad, because if you do the same thing as we did before, the holes, they will move up towards the, the gain region, but they don't cause impact ionization or not as much. So your gain is very low. So what can we do? We can inject light from the top side. And if your uh, penetration depth is very low, what happens is your electrons, which are electron hole pairs are generated here, your holes are collected and your electrons are accelerated through this uh, electric field and your uh, response is very good. A very low penetration depths. But as you go to, for example, low low wavelengths of light, you get high gain, high wavelengths of light, a uh, low gain. So you can di differentiate between uh, different wavelengths of light. Um, so the idea is to make some detectors based on these two concepts uh, with waveguides on on top. So the two ideas is the APD type one, which is the P type where you have the gain on the backside. We optimize the entrance window, place the waveguide on top, well, the coupled optics will be here somewhere, and the light travels on the waveguide and you detect. And based on the wavelength of light, we should be getting a, a similar gain response for all wavelengths of light uh, for this type, which can be good for some applications. Or we have the, the opposite, where we have the gain region here, and this is looking at controlling or defining well the, the photons you want to look at, the different types of wavelengths. So if you want a, a UV or two, well, for example, a wavelength of 200 nanometers, we, we will uh, design the this region for that, the gain layer for that. If you want the slightly higher wavelengths, you increase the, uh, you modify the doping profiles and you can be specific for that wavelength. It sounds simple, but it takes a lot of fabrication processing and uh, simulation to control well. That, uh, the good thing about this type is that uh, you get a higher gain. So your response can be better, your signal to noise can be better, and, and it's uh, in terms faster. And I think that's all I have, yeah. So thanks for your attention and any questions. Thank you. Question for me. Uh, in the region where uh, your uh, wave is sending and going to the speaker, like that there you will have a lot of the scattering as well. Ah, yeah. So that's one thing we have to uh, work on as well. So there's different methods of trying to get the waveguide coupled well to that part. I mean, it's very simplified in this design where you might have. Like yeah, so there's different ways. So we can look at putting a polysilicon layer on top so that it's more flat, or we can look at uh, tapered edging to try to get the waveguide to be more smooth transition from the cladding area to the, the photodiode. But yeah, so we're looking into that as well. But yeah, I simplified that. Yeah, one, and to have an aspect on photonic chip. Uh, what is the size of this chip? What, uh, what is the size we are talking about? Millimeter, microns? Ah, for the waveguides, I mean, they're small, I mean, less than millimeters, uh, but the detectors will, uh, I think one of the designs was 10, 10 microns. 10 microns. The, the photodiode, the photo 10 diode. microns, yeah. It's really on almost at the edge of the technology. Yeah, in terms of the waveguides as well, they depends on the wavelength. You want the waveguide to be around a quarter of the, of the wavelength. wavelength for the <laughs> so we will get some loss because of the what we can achieve here. But the idea is that we understand that and just want to see if we can okay, detect yeah, that. Yeah. Of course, of course, yeah, exactly. it's a limit thing. Okay. Thank you very much, Lynn. So let's thank you again. Yeah. Speaker is Sandra Perez.
cu 6 de grei în chemistry uh, și from the Universitat Autonomă de Barcelona and she been working in uh, South Australia also far, very far away and uh, in 2019 she came back and started to work uh, yeah. so her talk is on wearable text text uh, based strain sensor for mo mo motion motion, motion. Yes. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, today I want to present my trigger project that is entitled What about textile based screen sensor for motion monitoring? And first of all, I want just to outline the presentation. Uh, I will present the motivation, the state of the art, the objectives, and the, the work plan. So nowadays, uh, most of us uh, wear uh, or use uh, wearable sensors, for example, the smart watches uh, that can monitor uh, our steps or our falls, for example. There are others um, that are used for playing games and they can monitor our movements. And um, the current wearable sensors are based on rigid electronics. And one of the main advantages in that case is that they are easy to manufacture. But um, they fail when they establish precise body contact. For this, uh, for this uh, uh, reason, it's interesting to design and fabricate flexible and flexible strain sensors that um, monitor better the human motion. They also provide an a non-intrusive and comfortable way to monitor this, this motion. But um, what are the flexible string sensors? They are based on string responsive materials that under a flexible, compressible, or stretchable conditions produce a resistance or capacitance change. And usually they are combined with a matrix, maybe a polymer or something like that, or the substrate as a flexible part. Here, for example, in this figure, you uh, can see the main uh, fields where the strain sensors are applied. For example, healthcare and biomedical engineering, where a strain sensor can monitor the respiration or falls, or even to deliver and the drug uh, to perform the drug delivery. Um, also, in gaming and virtual reality, and in sports, for example, for the whole body monitoring or the motion detection and others. And finally, in soft robots as well. In recent years, uh, the, this kind of sensors have been uh, intensively studied and uh, for their development have been used uh, different uh, functional materi materials that include, uh, so, uh, conductive polymers like PLPSS, uh, hydrogels, aerogels, uh, metallic nanowires, metallic and metal oxides nanoparticles, or carbon based materials. All of them should uh, show in uh, good electrical properties and high deformability. And more recently, the combination of functional materials and textile substrates uh, has emerged as an um, exceptional uh, approach for the um, development of this kind of sensors. From the point of view of fabrication, um, the, the researchers have been explored different uh, technologies that include uh, pattern transferring, uh, drop casting, spin printing, inject printing, vacuum filtration, or, spin, or spray coating but also evaporation and other techniques that can be applied in, in clean rooms, for example. But I, in other words, um, people has always uh, studied the, um, the development of conductive fibers that are uh, incorporated to the fabrics by sewing, knitting, weaving, or embroidery. But how works a uh, string sensor? Well, the strain sensor uh, relies on the use of conductive materials whose electrical properties change when a mechanical uh, strain is applied. For example, uh, tension or compressing work. 
there uh, the, there is a change uh, in resistance that is influenced by the geometric alterations in the area or the length or even by the resistive or resistive behavior that changes uh, the um, resistivity or the conductivity of the electrode or the active material. In the next uh, figure, uh, it illustrates how can we perform uh, the, the motion uh, monitoring and it is floated the, the, the change in the, in the resistance against time. And for example, in that case, when we try to uh, monitor the working, we, we can even differentiate between the slow steps and when you work normally. So let's move now to the objective. Here, the main goal is the fabrication of, of flexible and stretchable uh, textile-based screen sensors. And for that, for this purpose, uh, different specific objectives have been set. The first one is the development of sustainable conductive inks, the evaluation of eco-friendly textile substrates, and the morphological and electrical characterization of the printed patterns, and finally, uh, the evaluation of the developed strain sensor. Here it's important um, to focus on the sustainability because uh, the current conventional wearable sensors, uh, based on the rigid electronic, uh, generate a lot of uh, electronic waste. So, as a summary of the work plan, first of all, um, conductive things will be formulated based on the conductive materials and functional materials that I will describe later. Then um, the developed things will be printed on textile substrates, will be an electrical, morphological, and mechanical characterization, then the sensor design, and finally the evaluation of the sensor performance. For this, uh, for this purpose, some requirements need to be fulfilled. Uh, in that case, uh, to find materials with low elastic modulus, uh, look for good flexibility, good sensitivity, sensitivity, durability, scalability to mass production, and the sustainability of the whole process or the materials we want to use. Uh, to achieve these uh, objectives, the work, uh, the, the project is divided into main work packages. The first one is the inform ink development, uh, starting for the formulation of the inks. Um, will be studied materials uh, based on carbon or the nanoparticles uh, in combination with hydrogels or um, biopolymers. I I've been working in previous work with Think and Molybdenum. Um, that uh, will be the ones that I will use for start. Then um, about the in characterization in task 1.2, uh, will be selected the appropriate, well, the good solvents for the stability of these uh, materials will study the use of keeping agents and will determine the rheological proper properties of the inks because in that case, for example, the viscosity or the surface tension is, is important when you try to print. And um, it's also, you need to take account the viscosity, for example, to choose the, the inject techno I, the printing technology. Then the selection of textile substrates. Uh, I will try to use uh, sustainable, sustainable substrates, but and there are some companies that are trying to to produce uh, to fabricate polyester, uh, what eco-friendly uh, polyesters now. So could be a, as well a possible. And the last. The last task in that section will be the selection of the printing conditions. Taking advantage of the facilities in our uh, institute, in the, labor, in the printer laboratory, 
will have available in inject printing, screen printed, and direct ink printing. Um, to choose the, the better technology to print the, the inks, we will take into account the, the viscosity, but also the thickness of the film that we want to print. And the second work package will be the evaluation of the strain uh, flexible sensors. First, we will print with the selected inks uh, the patterns into standard substrates that also in the textile. Then will be a characterization, uh, an electrical and morphological characterization. Um, then the, the, the stretchability and mechanical properties will be determined. And uh, in task 2.4, the sensor will be designed in terms of size or shape. And finally, the response of the string sensor will be, uh, will be tested apply, uh, applying uh, real in, strain in real conditions. And that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions. Question? Uh, so the, the strain sensitivity of the textile de depends on the separation distance between the conductive elements in the textile, or is there a, or is a matter of, uh, I don't know. Well, the sensitivity depends on the conductive material. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, and you... the and the substrate uh, as here as a flexible part. Yeah, but again, the, the, the resistance change that you expect is because you are changing. For example, if you are using the printing, you will have like a, a complete layer, or you will have like a. No, the idea is is uh, to obtain a film, okay. not just. Um, okay, okay, okay. So it's yeah. not a matter of the distance. No. It's no. How do you do these uh, tests on the tension? I mean, like the washer, you know, I imagine there is some procedure to... for the tensile yeah. test. Well, I I'm I haven't uh, I haven't experience on that, but the idea is to uh, fabricate some pieces and to place the the sensor using different degrees of bending okay. for tension and for the compression. Mm -hmm. Do something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But then, with different bending. Yes. But then there will be some special tests because it will be a change. Change, yes. From uh, washing machine or, you know, oh, yeah. like the standard uh, clothes that you use, there will mm -hmm. be some special uh, I think so, tests yes. to do, no? Mm -hmm. So this is for future. Uh, Yes. Yes. To, to evaluate the robustness yes. and durability. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Do you have that? Do I plan to use some these conductive things for the electrodes? Or yes, conductive things. Uh, uh, be sensitive to the to the stress. Hmm. Yes. So the idea is to. I. It's not well defined. Uh, yet, but oh, I will start with pink and molybdenum as a conductive uh, ink, and then maybe carbon based material because it's easy to to make the inks. Um, for example, with pink and molybdenum, I have problems with oxidation and I have to apply, for example, photonic curing for to to obtain a conductive film. Any conductive material may have strain sensitivity, or it depends on. Wait, uh, sorry. I mean, you know, just wondering if any conductive material like metallic or carbon may have a strain sensitivity, or I'm not, I'm uh, not sure about that. So it depends on the matrix also on the textile. Yes, I think so. Hmm. Because maybe some if it's not completely flexible, for example, it will crack or 
something like that. Um, you can lose the, the ability to 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 sense you. To, yeah. hmm. There are no more questions. Thank you. Thank you. We end the session here. I would like to thank all the speakers. Very interesting ideas. And I hope this.